recording and go live. Um, so I was just pre-warning. So uh, Now you I'm said a... when you stop sharing the screen, that's when you want me to start, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And let me make sure that you are spotlighted. Uh, that way I don't have to worry about changing that. And... Okay, sorry about that. Computer flipped out for a second. Sure. Uh, I'm getting ready to start it now, though. Okay. So one second. Uh, Willie, that I've realized what happened. It disconnected me. Can you make me host? Okay. Uh, is that you to say Willie Jones? Yeah. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. I was wondering, it took all my permissions away. Okay. I forgot, we've, we've never been in the same room together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it just flipped out on one, at one time. Okay, did, here we did go. Did he say he sent you the flyer? Do you have it? Uh, let me. Lily? Lily? If you could Let's go ahead and start without the flyer. Okay. Okay. And I got it. I just swapped it out right quick. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. I am Willie Jones, president of Women for Progress of Mississippi, Inc., an organization founded over 43 years ago by Mrs. Dorothy Stewart Samuel to be a catalyst for change in the state of Mississippi. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And this is wonderful, wonderful evening. Every Monday in the month of March, we want you to join us right here for Women's History Month, A Legacy of Courage. And we are excited tonight to join Dr. Wilma Mosley-Claplin, 
and NMHS Unlimited Films for the launch of Women's History Month, a legacy of courage to share the stories of women who through their work and life's journey have strengthened Mississippi and the communities they serve. And as we begin tonight, I want you to pick up your a nice cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever your favorite beverage is tonight. You want to relax. This is going to be an inspiring evening. We want you to be part of the conversation. So if you're listening here by your laptop or your phone, you can also make your any ask any questions in your comments and uh, and also just share with us. We want you to be part of the conversation tonight. And so we're so excited for you to join us and just uh, buckle your seatbelts and uh, we're going to have a wonderful ride for the month of March. And as we get started, I want to introduce the filmmaker for this series and CEO of NMHS Unlimited Films, Dr. Wilma Mosley Clopton. Dr. Clopton is a writer, producer, director, author, world traveler, wife, mother, grandmother, Mississippi, Mississippi native, and only daughter of the late Dr. Charles C. and Jesse Bryant Mosley. As the creator of NMHS Unlimited Film Productions, she is dedicated to highlighting the continued significant contributions of Mississippi African Americans to the state of Mississippi. Dr. Mosley Clopton's interest in Mississippi African American history is a passion which she has inherited from her mother. However, her love of research is a gift from her father. Dr. Mosley Clopton is a graduate of the University of Mississippi 10th Annual Filmmaking Workshop and the Barefoot Filmmakers work Workshop. She uses the medium of short documentary films to tell untold Mississippi stories. Her journey into the arts began many years ago as a practicing Baptist artist, but her excursion into film began in 2009. Her body of work to date includes numerous short films, four books, a children's coloring book, in one play. Dr. Mosley Clopton is a recipient of the 2011 Mississippi Humanities Educator Award, 2012 Mississippi's Top 50 Business Women, the 2013 Mississippi's Top uh, Business Women of the Year, the prestigious 2014 Mississippi Art Commission Media Fellowship Award, as well as the 2013 and 2015 Mississippi Film and Video Alliance Emerging Filmmaker Award. In addition to mentoring young entrepreneurs and filmmakers in 2016, Dr. Clopton also received the Award of Merit from the Mississippi Historical Society for Exemplary Documentary Film Projects, highlighting the significant contributions of African Americans in the state of Mississippi. Dr. Clopton is recognized by many as a major film player in film, television, arts, and education arenas. She has charged herself with preserving her own legacy while preserving the legacy of us all. You'll get to learn much more about the work of NMHS Unlimited Films during this month of March. So we're so glad and happy to join you. And will you help me where you are? to welcome Dr. Wilma Mosley Clapton. Hello, Dr. Clapton. Uh, helpful, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I guess that, that introduction might be longer than some of my film, but thank <laughs> you so much. I'm so excited to uh, be partnering with Women for Progress on this particular series, because when we thought about it, we said we wanted to reach as many people as possible. And my first choice, of course, is, is your organization, Ms. Jones, and the, and the many women that you serve. And when we talked about it, you know, you, you had emailed me about doing something. It was interesting that we were both in the process of doing the same thing parallel. I said, well, why don't we just join up and yeah. do it? But let me talk just for a minute about why I wanted to do this series. When people talk about legends of courage, they only think of the now. But we are looking at an opportunity to do research search that shows that courage is generational. Courage is something that when people hand down by seeing others do it, every society 
passes on their tradition of history and myths and customs from generation to the other generation. And because of the extreme conditions under which the people of African descent had to thrive in the new world, we many times passed on, we were forced to live and pass on our roots, our African roots, by oral tradition or through demonstration of actions. And the elders were able to pass on these traditions without being noticed. And so when we talk about legacy of coverage, we're talking about generations and generations which passed on the survival techniques that were necessary in order for us to survive. Mm -hmm. Now, most people would like to think that the civil rights movement started and arose in the 50s and 60s, but in reality, it's the result of generations of people of African descent leading by example and preparing and equipping each new generation to come. I was introduced to a book uh, entitled I've Got the Light of Freedom, uh, The Organizing Tradition and the Mississippi Freedom Struggle. And it was written by Charles Payne. And in that he talks, he quotes Eric, what's, oh, Erickson, who said, who's a psychologist, and he said, the values of any new generation are not sprung full blown from their head to their toes. They are inherent, if not clearly articulated, in the older generation. Mm. And that's what we're going to examine this entire month. We're going to look at women who, who, by the models that they saw, whether male or female, ended up making their particular mark on the not only just the state, but the country. And that's why this first film, The Impact of One, is so important. It's about Gladys Noel Bates. Now, Gladys Noel Bates grew up in a family that was active, as you'll hear her say in the film shortly, that was active. And she saw the impact that her parents made and her grandparents made and even her great grandparents made, which passed down. And so therefore, she decided to take a stance for equal pay for teachers. Mm. It was understood that. Well, you'll see, but it was understood that in Mississippi, People of African descent did not make the same amount of money as a teacher, even though they were qualified in the same qualifications as their white counterparts. In many instances, they would only get one third to one half the amount, if they were lucky, as their white counterpart. And that is why Gladys Noel Bates decided she was going to take a stand. So let me share with you now the impact of one.
really honor Mrs. Gladys Noel Bates for being a she-ro, a hero of the 20th century, a civil rights pioneer and educator who filed a lawsuit, Gladys Noel Bates versus the state of Mississippi, in 1948 charging salary discrimination against African American teachers and principals. The Gladys Noel Bates teacher equalization pay suit was the first civil rights suit filed in the history of this state. On behalf of the city of Jackson, the state of Mississippi, teachers and principals everywhere, we humbly honor you. Now speaking to us today regarding this wonderful woman's legacy, is the first African American woman to be voted into the Mississippi House of Representatives, District 69, Representative Alice G. Clark. Gladys Noel Bates had a dream that one day, one day, black teachers would make the same thing that white teachers were getting. She had a dream that one day, black teachers would get the same kind of retirement that white teachers were getting. On behalf of all of those who were teaching when you were teaching, I say thank you. I especially say thank you on behalf of Miss Fanny Alice Griffin, my mama. She taught school for... 43 years and part of that she did that along with when Gladys was doing it but my mama was afraid to join the suit because mama was afraid that she would lose her job she was afraid that we wouldn't be able to get money to use for the farm if you lived up in the Delta Bell is on it where I'm from you couldn't borrow money if you were part of a lawsuit to do those kind of things but Glass was strong enough, had the strength, and for that we say thank you. Thank you for what we now receive, what we've done, and what we will on behalf of you. We say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a delight it is to be here. And, uh, you know, these were, these were ugly times years ago. How comforting in many ways that this marker... Uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Department of Archives and History is an official recognition of the contribution that you've made to our state. What you did certainly has made that possible. And so I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Department of Archives and History. I'm not the person that you should be honoring today. It should be my parents, A.J. Noah and Susie H. Noah. <coughs> They were the ones who, as a child, began to give me the inspiration that all men are equal and should have equal opportunities. When the time came when we began discussing the possibility of filing a lawsuit, I asked my dad, Papa, do you think I'm capable? He said, baby, you decide that. So I decided that I should be the one. And it has been a memorable experience to know that here in this state of Mississippi, where inequality has been the reigning force for so many hundreds of years, that now we have equality of education, I hope. Uh, and, uh, I'm very, very, huh? What? <laughs> He's good. <laughs> yes. That's what the family told her when we left. Yes. Uh, this has been a wonderful experience, one that I'm proud that I have been able to be a part of before I left this world, uh, to know that my state of Mississippi, in which I was born, reared, and educated, has now given recognition to a cause that was just and right and equal. I want to thank all of you who have participated, who have shared this moment with me, who have shared the moments all through the years with me. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. And now... For this occasion, 
It's one that I shall ever remember. Shall ever remember. That here in the state of Mississippi, one in which I have been denied equal opportunity, I have been slapped down, knocked down, deprived of equal rights for so many years as a child and as, as a young adult. And now here in this state, there is a marker that is marking the existence of such a person as I and my family. Thank you so much. What an inspiring film. And I want to read one of the quotes that uh, one of our guests tonight, I think she has set the stage for our conversation, speaks to this very eloquent film that uh, touches our hearts and our minds and our spirits tonight. And I felt very comforted uh, by the conversation and, um, and the film. And this, um, one of our guests stated, Miss Gladys Noel Bates, a true woman of courage, especially during these unsettling times. So grateful for her perseverance and tenacity. And that speaks to where we are. This Women's History Month in 2021 should be the grandest celebration for us. We as women have went, come through some very challenging times in 2020. And this is our space. Uh, we have strengthened ourselves. We have linked hands with each other. And so for the month of March and this, and this series of conversations is going to be a time for really for us to empower each other, to inspire each other, and to share the work of each other and the courage that we ha have, have really, really shown for this past year and previous years. So thank you all again for joining us tonight. We hope that you enjoyed this film. I want to remind you again, every Monday night at 7 p.m. in the month of March, we will have one of Dr. Mosley Clopton's films and a following conversation at 7 p.m. every Monday night. So we want you to continue to join us. Thanks so much for all of you that are in the chat that have chimed in and are part of this conversation tonight. So let's just get started. We're so excited to have you all tonight and to get started. And I want to welcome our panelists for tonight, Dr. Corrine Anderson, who is the creator of STAN, which stands for Sisters Taking Action and Nurturing Decision Makers, and Ms. Cassandra Welchland, co-convener and lead organizer for the Mississippi Black Women's Roundtable and former director and co-founder of what we affectionately call MWEZY, which stands for Making Women Economically Secure Initiative. Now, welcome to the program, ladies. I think you, if you all yeah. unmute yourselves. Thank you okay. for having me. Hey, okay. everybody. <laughs> Now, ladies, I want to start tonight by asking both of you have created 
impactful organizations and are leading impactful organizations. Share with us tonight for your opening conversation, uh, what was the catalyst for the creation of these organizations? I guess Cassandra's gonna let me go first, age before beauty. That's right, <laughs> now, I will let you go first. <laughs> Actually, I, I am a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Central Mississippi Chapter, and I've been their public policy chair for a while. The idea of bringing women together came from a, a number of women saying that we are fighting for the same kinds of things in the legislature, and perhaps we can have a conversation together and move towards coalitioning. So that is basically how we started and since I am told once and only once to do something, I went ahead and helped to get the framework started for that in 2013. And actually, Willie Jones, uh, Women for Progress, and uh, a number of other, other organizations came together with us in City Hall in Jackson. And we decided to coalesce and form a common agenda. And that's how we got started. Thank you. Um, so the Mississippi... Um, Black Women's Roundtable is actually um, an affiliate of the National Black Women's Roundtable that was started in 19, uh, early 1950s. And um, Dr. Dorothy Height uh, was the co-founder of, um, of, the, of the national organization. And what came from that organization and why I was uh, founded was that so many Black women were already doing the work of organizing on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so she, along with some other women, said, we need to give voice and name to who is already doing this work. Mm -hmm. And so the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation was born with the arm of Black Women's Roundtable. And so now I believe there are 12 affiliates across the, the country, and most of them are in the South. And so I was asked to lead the Mississippi chapter, which is an intergenerational network of Black women and girls um, working to increase the civic you know, engagement, um, uh, the um, working to champion public policies for Black women and girls and increase the voter uh, participation as well because we know we win at the voting booth. And so i am just been really proud to, you know, be at the helm of this organization and the Women's Economic Security Initiative, which uh, is still a part of, it's a program now under Black Women's Roundtable, co-founder that work. And it was important for us to launch that because working at the um, as an activist, as an advocate, there was no focus on women um, at the legislature as um, at a women's agenda. And we thought it was important that we put together a women's agenda um, that prioritized us in the budget making process, but also in the formation and implementation of that and so of, of the policy. So we was like, no, we need to talk about women um, because we know who's in the legislature, mm -hmm. you know, men and mostly white men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was important that we develop our own women's agenda so that we can center women's voices um, at that policy table. And Dr. Clopton, you picked this particular uh, film out of your array of, of, of films that you have produced uh, of women of courage to tie our conversation with these incredible women that we're talking with tonight, uh, what what did you make the connection between the two? Well, it was interesting that you put the question that way because actually Dr. Anderson was always asking me about, she noticed everybody else was mother daughter and then she let me know that Cassandra is her adopted daughter, so to speak. <laughs> But I put them together because the, the Gladys Knoll based film is specifically talking about equal pay. And it's interesting that recently these two organizations, the Stan organization and the Black Women's Roundtable, had to come together to coalesce around the same issue in 2021. Mm -hmm. 
And so I thought that they, not only are they strong women from generation to generation, because we're going to get into Cassandra's story and we're going to hopefully have time to get into yours too, Dr. Anderson. But that's why I put them together is because the issue that we thought was settled by the Gladys Noel Bates first civil rights case is not. And so I would like them to talk about, Cassandra, I want you to start first to talk about how this came up and what the process was. I guess I'll, we can both talk about it in some way because this is a part of awareness that what we think we have, we're losing. And we need to be able to have people like you, yourselves to keep us informed. Yep. Um, I had no clue this story even existed. And Dr. Anderson was the key to that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she said, you know, Dr. Clopton has this story um, of, you know, this former teacher and she tells me her name and I'm just like, I'm really kind of confused. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, we've been fighting this. I have never heard of this story before. And so I ended up calling Dr. Clopton and she tells me the story and I'm just in awe. And then I began, I'm a connector. And so I, be, my mind, my brain, everything began to just work. And I say, like, wow, this is the, the freshness to the story because we keep talking about it and talking about it, but no media has been talking about it with us, have been picking up over, you know, this past uh, year. And so we was like, no, this is the story that we need to elevate, that there is a history to it. And Mississippi still hadn't passed, you know, a, a state equal pay law for everyone. And Mrs. Bates' story could help leverage that. And it brings in another group of people, which are black teachers, mm-hmm. you know, to help be in partnership and, and lift us up. And so we actually ended up doing um, a coffee con conversation with black teachers on, I believe, it, I think it was Black Women's Equal Pay Day, I believe. I can't mm-hmm. remember. Yeah, yeah, Black Women's Equal Pay Day. This is when I learned about all of this. And I was like, well, we got to have, we got to have, you know, Dr. Clopton on. And she allowed us to air the film um, for 24 hours. And it w- that's how it came together. So um, now that Mississippi, you know, don't have a law, Mrs. Bates' um, story gives us an opportunity to ground um, ground the story, but also the policies that we're trying to push, ground that and bring it back up and bring a f- and bring new groups of people into it, which are our black teachers um, I- I- into the forefront. So that's how it happened. And um, yeah, that's that's how it happened. Dr. Anderson. I'm sitting here in, enthralled with Cassandra's uh, uh, explanation of a, a number of things, but Actually, one of the things that Cassandra said a couple of years back when she was pushing for equal pay legislation and trying to get the number of us involved, she said, we really don't have enough emphasis from women that we are creating enough noise. Those are my translated words for you, Cassandra. However, I thought back to when Lynn Fitch said for the Clarion Ledger, she thinks bills aren't passing in part because of a lack of public outrage and education about pay inequality. inequality. And we had a conversation about that. Perhaps half of that is true, if not all of it. So we have to make sure in our organizations that we are telling the stories and making sure, and Willie's, Willie's model, she's actually used the radio and every other thing she can to make sure that we're telling people, but perhaps we're not educating the right people and, and in terms of what we're doing in our united efforts, because when spider webs unite, they do tie up lions. We have to make sure that we get that message out and continue to do so. And Mississippi is last again in terms of equal pay, mm-hmm. but we shall continue and we shall overcome. And I think part of that, too, was that Mrs. Bates is a black teacher, right? Yeah. And it kept connect back to all the data that we had recently done, that black women were only making 56 cents on the dollar. And then here's some of the data points from Mrs. Bates about what teachers were making. I was like, wow, this is, this is, a, this is not a new fight. It still is an old fight. You know, and what you said, um, Dr. Plopton, 
like we're still in this fight, but she won part of it, but now we got to take it all the way. And that's the story I want to have lifted. I think, I think storytelling and narrative change is really what helps us, you know, elevate the issue more. And so, um, so that's why, you know, I was like, we got to have more of this conversation. And we and my understanding now, this upcoming legislative, uh, I mean, this upcoming um, summer that uh, we are pushing to have a hearing on equal pay. We've never had a hearing. And so the the Senate um, chair of labor, Senator Horn, is now willing to entertain that. So we're excited about it and we want to bring this story forward. And uh, and this is a good good place where I want to highlight two points. One, um, why Dr. Clopton has decided to pair these films together with a conversation through the month of March is because this type of storytelling and uh, and connecting the dots and and as uh, Dr. Anderson says about the spider webs coming together. That's what this month of, of March is about. And then uh, Dr. Anderson made a statement that when she read that uh, Finch said that not enough people are enraged. And so when we talk about courage and activism and the word mm-hmm. activist, because we're mm-hmm. still using, I don't think we use the word enough activist. And, and I think we have to, even in 2021, begin to redefine what that means. Because when we talk about being outraged, (laughs) most activists are outraged about something. They're outraged about (laughs) their cause. And then then that courage kicks in. So uh, Dr. Anderson and, and, and Cassandra, Talk to us about how act what how is activists should be defined, and uh, and talk a little bit about the courage it takes for women these days to get things done. And I think Dr. Anderson, my definition, okay. my definition of an activist, <clears throat> basically one who recognizes the need to get involved. Involved is an action word in terms of involvement and get yourself in the cause and stand up for that cause. But I'm more fascinated with the word courage as it, it, as it goes to when one decides to become an activist. And I look at the word courage as a kindergarten or first grader would, looking at all of the letters of it, and I fixate on you rage. Mm. In, in, the, in, in terms of courage, wherever you start and wherever you jump in, there is something that motivates you to the point if you mm-hmm. rage about the injustices or the unfairness or the inequities, or as my grandma would say, it just ain't right. Mm-hmm. And, and so you, you get upset about it and then you move into action. And some people have more visibility in terms of the action and, and some are lead from behind. But I think the courage part of it is recognizing that you are a part of a larger thing mm-hmm. and the community needs the voices of all of us and so in sitting, instead of sitting on the stool to do nothing, you got to get up, do something, and stand for something, and say something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't have very much more to add to that. I agree <laughs> with all of that. Only thing I would say um, with activism, um, I, I, when, when you said that, I could only think of John Lewis. Mm-hmm. You know, John Lewis said, get into some good trouble. Um, if you see a need, you know, the scripture do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the good Samaritan story. It's the things that our parents teach us, have taught us growing up that you get involved and you see someone hurt, you stand up and you, and you do something that's good trouble. And, um, and the courage for me, uh, when I think about it, just a mini story is, I had it, I had it, I have an auntie who made me um, stand up to a bully. And the bully had been bullying me for weeks on the school bus. I was just, I was just nine years old. And I remember always, I would see these older teens or kids on the bus and they would, um, 
they would be doing stuff to the to the younger kids. And I'm young too, but I remember always saying, you can't do that to them. And they'll push me around, but I still kept coming forward. But this one lady, young girl, she was much bigger than me and she was terrifying to me. And I, we got off the school bus and I went into the house and my aunt saw all the kids gathering. And she said, what's that? Okay. about and I tried to ignore her. and I went in the house so she went outside if and on and she said come on we're going down here you're going to confront you're going to confront this girl I was like I cannot confront her no way that if you don't confront her y'all already know what's going to happen I'm going to confront <laughs> you and you're not going to like it <laughs> so she took me down to the girl's house that was just like right there and she said now you tell her how she's made you feel. And I was so scared, but I told her, but the more I kept doing it and saying it, the more courageous I got and stronger I got. So it was so, and, and to this day, I stand up to my bullies because of that experience. But my aunt said, um, what that made me think of and how I lived that out is afraid, just do it. The courage will kick in. And that's kind of how I live it out loud. Sometimes I need a lot of coaxing, you know, coaxing to get to it, but I do it afraid and the courage kicks in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good time to segue into generational courage because I don't want us to miss the focus of this program. Both of you have had role models that showed you what courage was about. You, you were talking about your aunt. But you also had someone else that was very courageous in your life, Cassandra. And I want you to talk about that first, and then I'll go to Dr. Anderson. Yeah, um, she was so amazing. And um, wow. And they kind of go together. But one is um, Eva Thompson. Um, Eva Thompson is my grandmother. But she is also the foster mother to my mom and her five siblings. She took in my mother and her siblings um, because their mother ended up contracting tuberculosis and came to Jackson and left them in Hazelhurst and left them down there in a very kind of abusive situation. And so my grandmother met Gwendolyn Loper <laughs> and Gwendolyn Loper um, got all those children placed in my um, my in, in Eva Thompson's household and Eva Thompson raised those children as if they were hers and they were her foster mother until she died at age 84 years old but she raised me and I'm the eldest grandkid, and she raised me as her own. And I never knew her as foster grandmother, foster mother. She was grandma. But I often say that she taught me what service was. And my mother's work experience taught me what um, justice was. But Eva Thompson, you know, was the caretaker of the people in the community. And it was my job to um, take the food to those folks who didn't have family. Right. And she would say she never could say my name. So she called me Sonda. Sonda. So she said, Sonda, I need you to go over there and I need you to sit with them, comb their hair, uh, whatever they need. But I learned service that way. And it was an extension of my grandmother who took in my mom and her siblings. And she taught me that through action. So her love manifested itself in action. And I learned that. Um, and so it was the service leadership um, that I learned. And that's, she was just incredible and amazing. And so thankful for her and Mrs. Loper for what, what they gave me. Dr. Anderson? You're muted. Mute. Seems like it's a night for grandmother stories. <laughs> uh, I'm from Yazoo City. Uh, 
And I'm, I was sitting here thinking when you did the film with uh, Gladys Noel Bates, I was seven years old when Gladys Noel Bates filed her suit, it seems. Wow. Uh, but uh, living in Arizona City, I was born to a teenage mom and a dad. And so my grandmother raised me. And, and my grandmother was a big boned woman with a quick temper and a sharp tongue. And I was always afraid because, you know, at that time in, in our lives and situations, we were afraid of, of the white folks, what they were going to do to uppity Negroes uh, in terms of that. And my grandmother was truly an uppity Negro in terms of that. Um, she, she was the oldest of 18 children. And uh, her mom was one, one step removed from slavery. So my grandmother grew up, as she told me from her stories, she grew up fighting for her sisters and brothers because she said that the neighboring uh, farmers who happened to be white and itinerant people who came through the neighborhood in their 20s and in their 30s were always trying to do something to one of her sisters or brothers. And so she constantly took up for them. And I can remember hearing people say uh, in Yazoo City, when my grandmother would say something and speak her mind, they would say, Betty's crazy. She ain't got no sense uh, because, she would speak, <laughs> because she would speak up. And she, I was an only child, and she taught me to, to speak up and do things for myself. They would call her crazy, but they rarely said it to her face uh, in, in terms of that. The other thing, the other side of my grandmother, th those were the days when uh, – we learned that people were coming through Yazoo City on the trains. They were called they were called hobos, and they would come up into the towns and uh, seeking food. And that my grandma would always feed people. She always had something on the back of the stove that she would feed, and she would say to me, "You know, uh, I am my brother's keepers, whether they be old white, poor white folks, or poor black folks," <laughs> and mm. say it. And she would go ahead and do it, and she would always tell me. For, you, for those who got more than other people, you've got to do something and share with them. And for people who don't speak up for themselves, you've got to learn to speak up. Now, you understand you're an only child. I'll speak up for you if you can't find the words. But <laughs> she constantly told me how to do those things. So I grew up knowing I had two responsibilities. One of them was to realize that I was my brother's keeper. So if I had more than somebody else, I would always share. And sometimes she'd get upset at me because I would share money that she sent me to the store with. I'd take her money and give some of that to somebody who said they wanted a, you know, a piece of bologna or something like that. So, so my grandmother is definitely the person that you know, I think helped to mold me. And then her other, other uh, thing that she would say to me that I still hear it today. She says, you ain't got no choice. You're going to get an education. And you're going to be somebody tell me that all of the time and it was almost like a theme song of hers and then she would make sure that I understood that there was nobody she was saying nobody better than you mm -hmm. she said you hold your head up and you keep on going and you take up for others who can't take up for themselves and I guess that's why I'm, I'm constantly looking for causes and reasons to to get involved in uh, as as uh, my mother-in-law was i just can't sit and hold my hands I've, I've got to find another thing to do to help somebody along the way and i know this is not what you you definitely want to hear but i have to tell you my one thing that motivates me every day i know that there's saint peter up there at the gate and i hope that the book that he writes on me has a lot of things in it that are good to offset those things that may not be so good in terms of that. But if nothing else is said about me, I hope that people will say that I tried to be a servant and to help others. And that's pretty much from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cumberland, so, before we move forward, I want to just say to our audience that if they have any comments, please make them known in the, in the um, uh, comment area of Facebook. Uh, we want you to be part of the conversation tonight. If you have any questions of our guests, please ask them because we're watching uh, your conversation with us. And if you have a question for Dr. Kareen Anderson or Ms. Cassandra Welton, please chime in. Uh, or if you have something you'd like for us to share uh, in this conversation, please give us your comments and we'll be glad to share them. And uh, and also we want we want your information 
and your thoughts on the film tonight, uh, please add those to the comments also regarding the film. And, uh, and just want to remind you again that those who you who just jumped on, that you're listening to the Women's History Month series, A Legacy of Courage. And we'll be meeting every Monday in the month of March at the same time every night uh, on Mondays from at 7 p.m. And we'll be live here on Facebook. And uh, we'll also be live at womenforprogressradio.com. So beginning next week, you can go directly to that page, womenforprogressradio.com, and get it live there also. Also, right here tonight, we're live through everywhere you get your podcasts, Spreaker Radio, Spotify, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. You can give us, you can get us live there also. And the wonderful thing about tonight's program, you can share it with all your friends and relatives, even past this conversation tonight. So we just want to thank you again for joining us. And, um, and Dr. Clopton, we'll continue our conversation. Well, she threw it back to me so quickly. I didn't have a chance to think (laughs) that it was ready, but I am. I want to thank you, Ms. Jones, number one, because the other people talked about, you know, I had the other panelists talk about who their role models are, but you are a woman of courage Mm -hmm. and you are also making a great impact. So can you share with us and then I'll share. We only have what, 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. You share what motivated you, who motivated you, was, how many generations back do, does it go? Because I think this is important going along with what we're talking about in terms of generational courage. Yeah, thank you so much for asking that because I always like to talk about the two incredible women that inspired me to be Willie Jones, and that's my mother and my grandmother. And uh, like Dr. Anderson says, uh, my grandmother was a, she was a tall woman and she was... You just did not mess with her. But she was also a woman of so much love. Um, uh, I can remember her teaching us how to sew. She sat and talked with us. Uh, When I got ready to leave the state of Mississippi and and, uh, put my my, uh, roots elsewhere, she talked to me all night long, and it was like a swan song. I never forget waking up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning where I had dozed off, and she was still talking to me. It was almost as if she was pouring it into me, like this child is asleep, but she, I'm going to feed her unconsciousness, you know. But uh, she was a woman of so much courage and strength. Uh, in, in addition to my mom, my mom was an entrepreneur when the word was not even part of our vocabulary. You know, she was the Avon lady. She was the... Um, uh, uh, Ursha at the church. She owned her own uh, restaurant at one time. She was a farmer. So when we talk about non-traditional jobs and careers, I I understand that because my mom farmed over 80 acres of property and she was a real farmer. We She farmed uh, from the beginning to the end. She also sold and dis- distributed at the 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 uh, uh, food from that farm. We had pear archers. We had cows. We had horses. We had chicken coops. We had all those things, and she did that as a woman. My father died when I was about five years old, so she was a single parent also. So um, she th- all of these things it was not something that they just sat down with me one day and said, "Okay, this is how you do it," and this is um, you know this is what we did. I learned by watching them, by walking in their footsteps. But they were very, very stern about certain things. Um, you know, you you had you had to be a person of integrity. You had to have honesty. You had to have God in your life. She, they told us uh, and showed us how important that was. And 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 one thing most importantly that my mother taught me is every morning when we got ready to get up for school. We would hear her in the kitchen. It was almost like a drum. You know, we could hear her hitting the skillets and getting the food ready every morning. And when we got up and got ready to school, my mom already had the makeup on. She had her lipstick on. She was fully dressed and ready to go. And she had food on the table for us when we got off to school. Because when we got off to school, then she got up and did what she needed to do. And that type of strength and that type of courage um, 
just kind of seeped into my skin, into my bones. And I can always remember her saying to me, uh, even when there was uh, issues or problems that I had over the years as a young person, she said, okay, she was sitting, listening to me. She said, okay, so now what you going to do? <laughs> you know, so you, you just keep, you just kept moving. You get, you keep moving. You never give up. And one of the things that I learned from her life was that if you can get up and you can get through the day and see the light of the next day, everything was going to be all right. Cause you had another awesome. day to do it all over again. Uh, awesome. So that's what, those are the kind of women that I came from. Well, we have heard some really, all of us are smiling because these stories are just awesome. So I guess I need to jump in with my little story. So my mother, Dr. Jessie Bryant Mosley, was a five foot two fearless woman. And people thought she was taller than that, but she wasn't. She just wore high heels. <laughs> but she always told me the story about my grandmother. So we're all starting with our grandmothers. My grandmother was even shorter than my mother. And the first time I saw my grandmother, I was younger than six. I don't know how old, but we were going to see her in Fort Worth, Texas. And as we pulled up to her house, which was a nice little house, this woman was out there mowing the lawn, wearing shorts. I said, mother, is that my grandmother? She patted me. She said, yes, baby, that's your grandmother. That, that little, she was like four foot something. But she was a single mother, and she was a seamstress, and that's how she supported my mother. But she was even more creative than that. Mother always told me the story about when she wanted twin beds. And all she had was the regular standard-sized bed, you know, and it was an old spring mattress and the old whatever kind of stuff that goes with the old beds that we used to know. So what did my grandmother do? She cut the mattress and the springs in half to make herself a twin bed. <laughs> now that's some kind yeah. of courage. Mm -hmm. She she had mother at a very young age and she still managed to do everything that she needed needed for her. Then comes along little Jessie who teaches little Emma, which is me. The one thing that my mother passed on to me was to be fearless. Also, there was no no in my, in, there is no no, and there was no no in my vocabulary. That if there is something that needs to be done, you figure a way to do it, and then you go do it. You don't cry about it, you just go do it. And people are always amazed that they, they had taken me all over the United States, and we saw all of, the, all of the United States before I left home to go to college. So traveling was in my blood. They wanted me to see things. They wanted me to understand that there was a larger world. And that was invaluable because today I still like to travel. I still like to do things. I don't know the, the meaning of no. I try to find a way around it. And that came from generations of women telling me that you can do whatever you want to do. The last thing, somebody interviewed my mother and they asked her, how do you tell your children how to behave or who they are in the world of Mississippi. And mother's response was, I don't have to tell them anything. The world will teach them. So that is why she concentrated on having us think that we could do anything and be anything and achieve great things if we put our minds to it. And I think that's the thing that we're hearing from all of us, that we had some wonderful, wonderful guides who still guide us. And we're passing that on to other people. So before it gets too late, because I want we'll probably leave with one other question, but I do want to thank our sponsors. I mean, this oh, yeah. would not be happening wow. if it were not for these wonderful people, this wonderful progress of Mississippi Incorporated and DSC Training Academy, the Greater Jackson Arts Council, the Olivia Group, Action Leadership Institute, BJP Pharmacy, the American Association of University Women, Mississippi, Linda Siner, and Robert and Margaret Marnes. I am very, very thankful that these people think enough of what we are trying to do that they say that they would sponsor. So one quick thing as we leave, Dr. Anderson, 
what is the legacy that you hope to leave behind for young ladies? Mm. Uh, the young ladies that I'm working with, even now, I'm, I'm working with some people in Canton, some uh, 11th graders. You've got to get the education. You, you've just got to get the education. And part of that is, the other part of it is now, know the game you're in, whichever game, wherever you are, know that game and ask for the playbook. When you ask for the playbook, learn that playbook so well, it doesn't matter who is at the table you will be able to make sure they're following the rules and then get a seat at the table. We cannot make a difference if we don't have a seat at the table. We have to struggle to get a seat at the table and make sure our voices are heard and stand up, speak up and be courageous. Cassandra. Um, I tell my daughters and my son, Uh, But I got that big girl over there who's 16 years old. And I tell her all the time that I don't need your permission to push you into greatness. Mm. That's just what I'm going to do. And I think the legacy I want to leave for them is what my mom and my granny also left me is, is being great and the gifts that you have been given and use them all up. Just use them all up until there's nothing left of you and you just leave it on the field. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, for me, that's what I want to, I want to leave with my, my daughters and my son. Also all the other young women that um, I'm in touch with um, through black women's round table um, is use yourself up, you know, and leave it on the field and, and use every gift um, because you are great, but use every gift and just give yourself away. So, Ms. Jones, may I go before you and then you close us out, please? Yes, yes, please do. So, I would like people to know or to remember that the only no that matters is the one that you put on yourself. You can stop yourself. Don't let others stop you. So enter the world of there is no no in my vocabulary. And I have to agree with Cassandra, then give it your best shot and leave it all out there because it's nothing worse than wishing you had done it and you didn't. Right. Ms. Jones? Uh, I'm just going to leave one line. And I think uh, when I talk to women, and I talk to women every week all from all over, uh, is this thing about fear. I want us to embrace fear. You know, and, and I'm going to say something that's shocking. Fear is good. Mm-hmm. You know, fear is good. You ne- It's never good. I don't care if you're making a half million a year or your revenues are, are, are through the roof. You never, fear never leaves us. So don't worry about trying to get rid of fear. Embrace it. Embrace it. Utilize it. Uh, don't let it freeze you or stop you from, from what you want to get it done and accomplish. It's good, you know, you just have to push it back every day and just keep moving forward uh, and, and learn to live with it, you know. So I want to just remind everybody tonight, I want to thank everybody for jumping in. We had so many great comments tonight. Uh, we've heard from our, one of our sponsors, Greater Jackson Arts Council, who says that they're so proud to sponsor such a powerful work and they're happy to empower, help support and empower women. Um, Thanks so many of you uh, for making your comments tonight and continue to share with us in the comments and we'll be reaching out to you and, um, and, uh, and updating you. But I want to just remind you again, tonight has just been amazing. We want you to share it with all your family, your friends, and your loved ones. Remind you again that we're going to be here every Monday night through, through the month of March at 7 p.m. with another empowering conversation around courage. So uh, make sure you put all of these dates in your calendars. Continue to share this out with friends. If you want us to add you to our database so you can get reminders, put your uh, email or your cell number in the comment or either text us at 601-259-6770. 601-259-6770. You can text us your name, 
your email address or either your cell number and we'll put you in our database and you'll get reminders of not only these particular events of everything that's going on in the month of, of March. And to remind you again, you can get this on all of your, where you get your podcasts. All you have to do is put in the name of the topic of our conversation tonight, Women's History Series, A Legacy of Courage, or either just put in Women for Progress Radio. And the most recent conversation, which is this conversation tonight, will pop up. And you, it's just such an exciting thing to just hit that little share button also and share it with your friends and everything. So we want you to uh, share this conversation with with these incredible women, Dr. Uh, uh, Kareen Anderson and Miss Cassandra Welchel. Thank you, ladies, for being with us tonight. Dr. Clopton, I tell you, we just got to give you a pat on the back. Yeah. Well, this this uh this has been amazing. This has been amazing. I love working with this woman because I get giddy, giddy, giddy. She keeps me on the edge of my seat. Uh, every time I talk with her, I am on the edge of my seat waiting on. She, I'm going to always leave the conversation or leave her space empowered, inspired, and most importantly, as a black African-American woman, I leave her presence feeling yes. loved feeling so much love. And we so thank you so much for everything that you do for the state of Mississippi and the powerful work for thank you for continuing to share our stories and doing just what we're doing tonight is empowering us through conversation and dialogue. So thank you all so much. It's been wonderful. We can't close this night, but I thank so, so much to Josh Watson at New Level Studios for uh, hosting this uh, show tonight for us. And, and a new friend that we have together, Ms., Mr. Ken Day Gaynor, who's with Excel uh, Inc., Excel Inc., who did the graphics for us tonight. We're looking forward to working with you, and we thank you all so much. Ladies, thanks so much for joining us. And remember, Thanks. next Monday night at 7 p.m., same time, got a great conversation for you. Dr. Clopton, did you have something else to add? You said it all. Thank okay. you. All right. Good evening, ladies. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>